imagine standing there. It's minus 70 degrees Celsius, a distant sun with harsh radiation impinging on you, swirling dust storms with highly abrasive particles which might be even toxic, um, the air pressure about one, less than 1% 1 of what we have here uh, on the place we are sitting in right now. And the best of all, your home is about 380 million kilometers from here where you're standing now. Welcome to Mars. So it's a world where a lot of us have kind of a little bit of a distorted perspective, mostly stemming from pictures like those or this one here where you realize Mars is, well, it's a cold, dry, boring desert. The thing is, this is a little bit tricky because um, you have to understand that Mars is a highly diverse world. It has canyons, mountains, ridges, polar caps, caves. Yeah, It's an adventurous place. Um, but that's not where you land the rover because it's too dangerous for the rover. So we're getting this kind of distorted picture. Um, and um, so if you think of a boring, dry desert, that's totally wrong. Because the more we learn about the red planet, the more we learn about its climate, its past, its atmosphere, its subsurface, there's one thing all those probes keep telling us over and over again. So all evidence suggests the one thing that Mars was much more like the Earth than it is nowadays. It had a magnetic field, it had a higher atmospheric density, it was warmer, basically might have looked just like this. This is not the Earth. This is how we imagine Mars about 3.5 billion years ago. So the bottom line is you could go deep sea diving 3.5 billion years ago in an ocean three kilometers deep on the red planet. Ain't that cool? So. Um, of course, then, if you do the numbers, you say, well, Mars came into existence 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. That means it had liquid water for about 1 billion years. That's about four times the amount of time on the Earth the life took to, to develop. So the big $1 million question is if life ever arose on Mars. And that's where my day job comes in. I've got probably one of the coolest pickup lines in a bar saying, oh, what did you do today? Yeah, I'm building spacecrafts for uh, searching for aliens. I'm being paid for that as well. That's cool. Um, so you first have to learn to ask the right questions. So if you look for life, what are you looking for? What is the smallest building block for life uh, you could imagine, like biological, um, biological precipitated materials, cell wall fragments, DNA fragments, uh, biomarker molecules? So what is it that differentiates life from, for example, ge geological features? So if you have to find the questions, you need the tools for this. So where do you look? What kind of instruments do you use? What kind of workflows do you follow? And that's where my day work comes in with in form of this lady. Not the lady inside, but the lady itself. That's Auda X. Auda is a 45 kilogram experimental spacecraft simulator. It takes about three hours to put it on. Um, it's a wearable ecological system, so to say. You can eat, you can drink in the system, uh, you, can, you can take a leak in the system if you have to, uh, you, can, uh, you can talk to the suit, there's gesture control. Um, for example, I brought um, an example of um, part of the middle gloves here. You, you get the chance to try them on actually in the break, so uh, make sure you have some idea of how to bind your shoelaces with the spacesuit gloves on. So that's also a first trick, first thing our analog astronauts learn. Why Auda? Auda is a name of a uh, princess, Indian princess. Some of you might uh, know Jules Verne and it's, uh, his novel Journey Around the World in 80 Days. That's the princess uh, he marries in the end. And she's like a princess to me as well. She's nice to look at, but she can be high maintenance. Um, it extends for experimental. So what the thing is, we are not just building a suit since many years here in the Austrian Space Forum, but we're also putting it to test. We what kind of small things you can do with your hands? What are the breaking points for the suit? We would put it into a cryo chamber at minus 110 degrees Celsius and see the suit tester and the suit are doing fine. So we are uh, like, you use it, overuse it, we, we see where it breaks and then make it better and get out again. We love to have the dirt below our fingernails. So we not only developed the suit itself, but we put it to trial into somewhat representative areas on this very planet. So the idea behind it is that, for example, here, this picture was taken in the uh, Dachstein ice case in Upper Austria. That's an area that doesn't look like you know, the Mars surface pictures you're used to, but the thing is, we have very good reason to believe there are Martian caves 
since about 10 years, we know pretty sure they are there. Um, and caves would be a natural point for retreating if life ever arose on Mars and then the environmental parameters were, were getting better and better, worse and worse on the planet. Because there's radiation shielding, you don't have micrometeorites, uh, you have a very benign um, uh, temperature stability environment and so so if life ever arose on Mars it would probably be surviving the last in those cases. We call them the so-called swan sea ecological niches, last songs of life on a dying planet. So we go there, uh, we put it to the test together with actually a geo radar which is slated for launch at the uh, ExoMars mission, the Wisdom Radar, and put our radar beams right into the eyes, hundreds of years old, look what's beneath, together with a, with a spacesuit uh, which is actually operating the, the radar, for example. We will go to strange places uh, which somewhat look like the Martian surface, like here in Rio Tinto in southern Spain. We were, uh, this is actually probably the, the most expensive car I've ever been driving, 1.4 million euros. After 10 years of development time, it was the first time it had uh, the chance to go out to the open. So it's, it's much more than a car. It has obviously two robotic arms with seven degrees of freedom. We, you can talk to the, the machine, so it's a fairly intelligent thing. So we are far beyond that old quasi-religious debate of sending robots versus humans on Mars. It almost sounded like, like a war going on between the robotics community and the human spaceflight community. No, we are saying send them both because they both have their distinctive advantages uh, which, which can be used if you have a clever flight planning. So your robot certainly should be, or something like your robot will be on board hopefully one day when we go to Mars. Um, and speaking of going to Mars, <laughs> okay. Uh, usually you say, yeah, if it's blue sky, it's the Earth, it's reddish sky, it's Mars. Well, that's true sometimes, yeah? The left picture was taken on the 15th of February last year in Morocco, close to the Algerian border in the northern Sahara, after a dust storm. And even here, the atmosphere doesn't look bluish anymore because so much dust, dust is in the, in the air. On the right side, that picture was taken just one week before at Mount Sharp, where the Mars Science Laboratory had landed. These were pictures just one week apart, but two worlds apart. So we're going to areas, even if you show those pictures to specialists, it would be hard for them to differentiate the which pictures which if you don't have the, uh, the writing there. So we're going to places where without much effort, you could actually imagine what it's like to stand on the surface of Mars. So one of the biggest privileges I have in my career is I get a sneak preview of the future by doing stuff and getting again the, the dirt under the fingernails, so to say. I'm not doing this alone. There is a huge team behind this in the Austrian space from pretty much everybody, a volunteer. For example, this is a, pic uh, a picture from our flight control room for the mission support center. We have flight planners, we have uh, remote science support specialists, we have media people, we have lawyers, yeah, you need them. Um, you have, um, you know, psychologists, biomedical engineers. We had more than 100 people from 23 nations taking part in the mission. Actually, three of those people are right here in the audience who participated here as well. And they might identify themselves in the near the break, I hope. Uh, and so you need those people, you need the workforce, you need a lot of training. We had more than two years of preparation before we were going to Morocco to make sure everything goes according to plan. So you, that what, that's what a typical day looks like. And that's the flight plan. Some people tend to call it a fight plan. Um, it's one of the two natural enemies of the astronaut. The other one is sand and dust, and the other one is the flight plan. No, seriously, um, this is defined month in advance, so we know very precisely who is going to do what at which time of the day to perform what kind of experiment. Speaking of those, you need, if you go to the desert, a big base camp. So that's an uh, uh, infrastructure you have to bring up there. We had to build up our own broadband um, uh, uh, wireless uh, system in the middle of the desert, making sure no camels will run over it uh, during the night, for example. These are things which are not really Mars-like, but you have to account for them as well. Um, you have beautiful night skies, obviously. Uh, we had two flyovers from the International Space Station at the second flyover with a life link to Cri Commander Chris Hatfield at the station and talking from Explorer team to Explorer team what our days would look like, for example. Um, we were having a lot of uh, robotic vehicles with us. Again, this is uh, the uh, uh, Magma rover from the Polish Mars Society together with my little thing here called the uh, uh, Life Laser. It's a bio, uh, biomarker fluorescence laser where we're looking for uh, biomolecules in the desert and we found quite some life in the desert, I have to say. Uh, this is the Puri rover. Actually, this is on the wrong planet. 
uh, it's from the Google Luna X Prize team, so it's supposed to go to the moon, but it made a detour over Mars in Morocco. Uh, even has not wheels. Yeah, it's called WEX, mixture of wheels and legs. You can climb over uh, steep terrain, and it's pretty uh, pretty cool. And there's a watch it over going over the rocks. Uh, we were going into you know, long range exploration. This is a scientific experiment. It just looks like fun. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this was for finding the perfect trajectories for uh, approaching certain sample sites. And I always say fun and science are s always compatible. Um, we're looking into what happens if something goes wrong. You, you sprain an ankle, you break your toe. We're looking into contingency scenarios. Like, for example, in Austria, when you go to the mountains, you get stuck. You always have your rescue tent with you. So we do this Martian style together with the Technical University of Vienna of uh, having an inflatable thing. It's, it's about the size of a car wheel, and if you get stuck because you break your toe or so, you unzip it, you push the right buttons, it goes like flip, 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 and you have this one. You open the pressure bottle, and you have an inflatable survival tent. Uh, with the hydraulics, you can even make a couch, a table or so inside. You close it, you seal it, you can take off a helmet and hope for help on the next day, for example. So you're thinking out of the box, you know, replacing GPS on Mars with, an, uh, with our own system, for example. This is a picture I always call CSI Mars. Um, it's for uh, investigating contamination issues to make sure you can uh, take the samples in a sterile way. And of course, no, we are not exploding the right leg of the astronaut. That's what I heard once. This, um, this brings me to the probably the most important part here to, to communicate to you, and that is Yes, we're doing serious science. There's just a special edition of the Astrobiology Journal coming out uh, in, uh, very soon with the scientific results of that mission. But uh, we are also trying to communicate the fact that these are humans who are doing those explorations. When we come to think of spacecrafts and space flight, we always think of people in white lab coats in a quasi-sterile environment when they're doing the last cruise before they, 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 they fly up with the, with the rocket. In reality, it means for those missions, you have people in the suit who are highly trained, you have still, they are sweating in the suit, they are, they are anxious to sometimes because your life depends also on the simulated suit that it works or so, and you want to tell that story. Like the famous um, North African explorer, but almost as a millennium ago, uh, Ibn Battuta said, traveling makes you speechless and then turns you into a storyteller. So why are we doing those things? Why are we investing so much? Why are we taking those risks for a mission where probably we are even too old to participate in 30 years from now? I strongly believe the first human to walk on Mars is already born and might be watching this on a live stream right now and going to an elementary school in Beijing or so. Um, so this is the Earth seen from, uh, from Mars, and one day there will be people standing and saying, seeing exactly that kind of picture uh, right after sunset, so why we're doing this. It is not for creating a, a 21st century equivalent of uh, the pyramids or for constructing a monument of technology or so. No, it's much more. It's a... It's a, it's a catalyst, it's, it's a very effective catalyst, like building kind of a, almost a Rosetta Stone for unlocking and unleashing dreams as yet undreamed. <laughs>